Welcome to Ask Stago. Expert answers to your expert questions. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Ask Stago, the podcast dedicated to answer to the question that you may have about our product or hemostasis in general. My name is Cecil Orke, Product Line Manager, and I'm really glad to be the co host of this new episode with Audrey Carlo, our Scientific Marketing Manager. Hello, Audrey. Hello, Cecil. So, Audrey, what is the subject of today's podcast? So today we will discuss the monitoring of heparin treatment and especially unfractionated heparin, UFH. We'll try to know which among APTT and anti-TNA is the most relevant assay in this context. Thank you. And to answer to the question uh, that you may have sent us, actually, we are glad to have a special guest for the second time, François de Passe. Hello, François. Hello. François, you are a clinical development director and once again, the most knowledgeable on the subject we will cover today. Uh, thank you. So let's start with our first question. François, can you explain us why would we need to monitor heparin treatment? Well, first, we probably have to say what is unfractionated heparin, UFH. UFH is a heterogeneous mixture of glycosaminoglycans of varying molecular weights, ranging from 5 to 30 kilodaltons. It is administered subcutaneously or intravenously. Pharmacokinetics of UFH is poorly predictable. After entering the bloodstream, heparin binds to many plasma proteins, other than antithrombin, reducing its anticoagulant activity. This nonspecific binding contributes to the variability of the anticoagulant response among patients. In addition to this variable activity, the therapeutic range of UFH is quite narrow, meaning that finally little variation is accepted when the product is in the patient's blood from a safety and efficacy standpoint. This makes that you have to carefully monitor UFH anticoagulant activity repeatedly for each patient in order to be sure he or she is not over or under anticoagulated. Well, UFH is probably one of the oldest anticoagulants, but it is still very widely used to anticoagulate patients. So it is strange that despite the difficulties you've just mentioned, narrow therapeutic range, poor prediction of its pharmacokinetics, it is so widely used. François, can you please explain us why? Because there are still indications or patient populations in which UFH cannot be replaced by any other anticoagulant, such as, for example, hospitalized patients undergoing cardiac surgery, and because it is cheap, it is also widely used in most countries. So uh, we know now that we need to monitor the drug for the patient safety. When I was on the field, I often heard uh, the debate on whether to prefer APTT or anti TNA activity to monitor UFH. Can you please tell us more about the APTT in this context? Yes, APTT is a widely available test that is used to monitor UFH. It is also cheaper than specific assays. However, the APTT therapeutic range is derived from a single retrospective study with a limited number of patients performed in 1972. This was a very empirical observation and the APTT regions available today in clinical laboratories are very different from the ones that were available at that time. Their sensitivity to heparin is also very different and varies across regions depending on their composition. So if I understand well, that means that the common statement saying that the patient is in therapeutic range when the APTT is pronged by 1.5 to 2.5 times the uh, normal time, it is not true anymore? Yes, absolutely. This statement can in no way be taken at face value. Each lab must determine locally its own APTT therapeutic range versus the anti activity with its own reagent instrument combination. The therapeutic range may also vary with the region batch, and this should be checked for load conversion. But I think that despite its wide availability, there are limitations for the use of the APTT for UFH monitoring too. Yes, you are true. APTT is influenced by many conditions. For instance, lupus anticoagulant will prolong the clotting time. In contrast, during inflammation, elevated factor VIII and elevated fibrinogen will have the tendency to shorten the APTT while an elevated CRP level may prolong it. Today, as UFH is often administered to inpatients in acute care or intensive care units, these interferences and the difficulty to establish a valid therapeutic range locally 
are major limitations to the appropriateness of APTT in this context. Besides, how can we make sure that an APTT result is valid for UFH monitoring? This is a crucial question when lapse activity is now governed by accreditation or certification. In addition, there is no specific calibrator nor controls for heparin monitoring with APTT. And so, what about the alternative tests uh, anti-10 ASA? In contrast to APTT, anti-10 A is well standardized with dedicated calibrators with ASA values traceable to the APRN international standard and dedicated quality controls. Besides, the interferences mentioned earlier for APTT do not exist for the anti ASA, except if the patient receives simultaneously another drug exhibiting an anti activity, such as direct oral anticoagulants. Nevertheless, conditions in which patients are under both UFH and DOAX are very scarce. So if I summarize then, the anti TNA is a preferred assay from an analytical standpoint. Definitely from an analytical standpoint, but it is also quite interesting to look at it from a clinical standpoint. For example, Christian Fruget showed in 2015 that with heparin monitoring using the anti TNA assay, the time to achieve the therapeutic range the number of dose changes within the first 24 hours of treatment to achieve this therapeutic range, and the number of hemorrhagic events were lower than with APTT monitoring. This is one paper, but others exist on the same matter, although always very empirical observations on small subsets of patients, which means that we lack a larger study for a stronger statement. Such a study would really be useful today. So we have seen the analytical and clinical aspects that are our prior concern. But what about the economical ones? Well, for sure, APTT is more accessible on a worldwide basis. And a, an APTT test is cheaper than an anti test. Yet, if we consider the decreased number of dose adjustments, the less frequent bleeding episodes, and thus need for transfusion products, anti can become more economically interesting, as Jeremy Van Diver published in Pharmacotherapy Journal in 2012. In a nutshell, anti is more expensive than APTT, but can offer benefits in terms of cost effectiveness. So this is not a single unknown equation. Thank you, Francois. I think we all got the point in favor of anti even if APTT is probably more accessible 24 hours per day and seven days a week anywhere. Yes, this is definitely a question of organization too, and an institution decision to compensate the cost of the ASA with an improved patient management and overall cost savings. It is now time to close this episode. You will find all the sources that we have talked about in the description of the podcast. Uh, so don't hesitate to check it out. Thank you, Francois, for answering to our question. It is really likely that appearance monitoring will be again a topic for future podcasts. Uh, there is so much to say. Thank you all for listening. We hope that you like it because we did. As usual, please feel free to send us any question that you may have at our email address, ask at stago.com, and we will be glad to answer it in the next episode. See you next time. Bye-bye. This podcast is brought to you by Stago. Diagnostics is in our blood.